The subcommittee will come to order. <clears throat> the chair will recognize himself for an opening statement. In the last few years, health information technologies, including mobile medical apps or applications, uh, electronic health records, personal health records, computerized health care provider order entry systems, and clinical decision support have transformed the provision of health care in this country. In September of this year, the FDA put forward a proposal in the form of final guidance indicating that software was a medical device for the purposes of regulation, except that software is not a medical device. To regulate it as such, the FDA, FDA has said it will use discretion to decide which software to regulate, except that no matter what Dr. Shearn may tell this committee here today, there is no guarantee that his successor won't go back on this guidance tomorrow. While guidance is a valuable tool for the FDA, there is a significant limitation, certainty. <clears throat> what stands today could change tomorrow. Patients and industry have told us that the FDA's involvement in guidance was a good thing. There was much too much ambigu ambiguity around the issue and companies needed to know what the FDA intended to do. In addition, many believe the FDA acted to the best of its ability with the only tool available to them, its medical device definition. But they also are telling Congress that we need to give FDA new tools that create regulatory certainty, not just today, but also tomorrow. That certainty can start with properly defining what these technologies are for the purposes of regulation. Representative Blackburn <coughs> and her colleagues on both sides of the aisle have outlined an approach that would give the FDA a new tool, a 21st century definition to regulate a 21st century technology. The Software Act is a starting place and an opportunity to begin a dialogue with thought leaders like the FDA. Representative Blackburn and five of her colleagues, Democrats and Republicans, have put forward one way to modernize the FDA so that it's ready to meet the challenge it has so far recognized it needs to meet. I commend her and her thoughtful approach to this issue and for her leadership. Dr. Schur and I stand ready to pledge this committee's support to help you modernize the agency in a way that makes sense for patients, for industry, and for the agency. And I hope you take this offer seriously and will agree to work with us toward a goal we all share. And to all the witnesses on both panels here today, I thank you for your testimony. And I yield the balance of my time to uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I applaud the uh, calling of this hearing. And I, too, want to uh, uh, mention uh, Congresswoman Blackburn and her bill. I'm not a sponsor yet, but we're looking at it seriously. Um, it is bipartisan, and the answer the issue is we need to we need a new tool to help us continue to modernize. Software is not a medical device, uh, and what you call something matters, especially as we have our tech companies trying to go through a uh, process. So um, I wanted to use this time to uh, thank my colleague for her work. Um, look forward to you coming back, Dr. Sharon, and uh, uh, discussing how we can uh, maybe give you some help and some tools so that we can uh, label devices, devices, and label software, software. With that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you. You'll back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes for opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the possibilities for mobile health technologies are promising and exciting, and there are so many functions that mobile health applications can be designed for from diet log to medication reminders to medical textbooks reference tools to ECG monitors and they play an increasingly important role in getting health information into the hands of consumers and helping patients take control of their health. They may also help doctors improve and facilitate patient care by for example providing instant mobile access to standards of care or helping to streamline their business processes. I think it's fair to say that we all want to encourage continued innovation, but it's also important that we shepherd these emerging technologies and make sure that they're safe and effective for patients. As with traditional medical devices, some mobile apps 
that operate in the health sphere could pose a risk to patient safety if they don't work as they're supposed to, and we want to make sure consumers can have confidence in the products that they use. When we last uh, had a hearing six months ago on health information technologies, we heard from stakeholders a desire for clarity on FDA's regulatory approach to mobile health applications and support for a risk-based strategy that protects patients, ensures product quality, and at the same time fosters innovation. The FDA has since finalized its guidance and laid out examples of the types of mobile applications, what it calls mobile medical applications, that the agency will apply its regulatory authority to. To me and from what I've heard from industry, FDA's guidance is very measured and risk-based. We had heard concerns before the final guidance was out that FDA was going to regulate smartphones and tablets as medical devices and stifle innovation through regulation. In fact, as we see now, FDA's guidance clearly states that it would not regulate the sale or general use of smartphones or tablets and would not consider the manufacturers of these products to be medical device manufacturers. Rather, the agency directs its oversight to those apps that are medical devices as defined in existing statute and that could pose a risk to patient safety. For certain mobile apps, such as those that purport to diagnose cancer or that recommend a dosage plan for radiation therapy, there should be a role for FDA to play to ensure they are safe and effective. And these are the kinds of apps FDA has said it will direct its oversight to. I appreciate that we have the opportunity today to discuss the Software Act, a bill introduced by my colleagues on our committee, Ms. Blackburn, Green, Ms. B Ms. Begette, Mr. Butterfield, and Mr. Gingrey. However, I have several concerns about this bill, starting with the timing. FDA's guidance was released barely two months ago, and we have not had the opportunity to see how it works in practice or to hear from industry whether it poses any barriers to innovation. In addition, a small but important provision was passed as part of the user fee law last summer, which required FDA, along with other federal agencies, to recommend an appropriate regulatory framework that ensures patient safety but also promotes innovation. These recommendations are not due until January of 2014, and I think it would be prudent for this committee to analyze and examine that report before moving any legislation. And that leads to my second concern, which is whether legislation is even necessary and whether it's the right approach to take. As we all know, the legislative process is slow, is slow <laughs> and in an environment where technologies are changing so rapidly, I question whether it makes sense to enshrine in statute something that may not work for an ever-evolving industry. Regarding the content of the bill itself, I also have concerns about what it seeks to achieve whether it meets those goals as written and what the consequences down the road would be if we were to permanently carve out certain types of mobile health apps uh, from FDA's oversight. So in closing, I look forward to learning more today about FDA's regulatory approach to mobile health apps and the potential impact of the Software Act. And again, thank you. And uh, of course, uh, thank Dr. Shearing for being here. Uh, I, Mr. Green, I, if I'll yield the remainder of the time to my colleague from Texas. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ranking Member Plone for yielding time, and I appreciate the majority holding a hearing on the Software Act, which I co-sponsor. I understand that there are concerns, but this proposal is a work in progress. It's important that we take time to get this right. A few weeks ago, the FDA issued guidance on mobile medical apps and other software, and I commend them for their thoughtfulness and leadership. Medical software and other health-related software is a quickly growing sector with unbelievable p potential. The FDA has done it all it can through enforcement discretion to the implement common steps, common sense steps to foster innovation and protect patient safety. Enforcement discretion is not a, the right tool, but it's all they have. It is Congress' obligation to give the FDA the tools necessary to properly protect patient safety and also to encourage innovation and create regulatory certainty. That's why the Software Act is important, and it is a work in progress. And I guess um, this is the first time uh, the Senate passed our compounding bill. And we learned with our effort on compounding that the FDA didn't have the authority or didn't think they had the authority, so we needed to deal with that. And I would hope we could get in front of the curve on software instead of behind the curve like we were on compounding. And I yield back my time. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, five minutes for opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it goes without saying that I am very pleased that we are holding the hearing uh, today, Tennessee is home to hundreds of health IT innovators, and they are grateful that we are a turn that we're turning our attention to this issue. They feel like it is is needed, and so, Dr. Shuren, I thank you for being with us. To the other witnesses that we have today, we welcome you. We look forward to hearing from you, and I do want to thank uh, my colleagues here on the committee. Um, 
Dr. Gingrey, Mr. Green, Mr. Butterfield, of course, Ms. DeGette, who have worked on the legislation. We appreciate the efforts that they have uh, put into this. The health informatics industry is innovating at a pace that I think is uh, startling to everyone who is watching. I am constantly amazed as I visit with these innovators and hear of their plans and look at their research and view the platforms that they are working with. Every day the use of technology becomes more ingrained in how health care is delivered in the U.S. As such, Congress has a very important role to play to ensure that our agencies tasked with ensuring the safety and efficacy of these technologies has the proper tools necessary to do the job to understand their mission and not to overstep. Unfortunately, the FDA is stuck trying to use a 1970s definition of a medical device to regulate mobile medical apps and other healthcare related software. We can all agree that there is certainly a role for the FDA to play as we go about determining the regulatory playing field for this growing sector and trying to funnel these products into existing outdated definitions is just not going to make any sense and it will not work. The Software Act would give the agency a needed tool for emerging technologies where necessary while allowing moderate to low risk technology developers the certainty necessary to proceed with development knowing full well what the regulatory playing field is going to be. It would provide certainty for our innovators who are constantly working to deliver health care in a more efficient manner. With their decisions in the September 2013 Mobile Apps guidance to use enforcement discretion to regulate only a subset of mobile medical apps, the FDA took an important step to acknowledge where their focus should be. Congress has the opportunity to go a bit further and codify this intent to ensure that our innovators have the clarity and certainty they need to continue to invest in this area and develop tools that will help make us healthier. At this time, I yield the balance of my time to Dr. Burgess, Vice Chair of the subcommittee. I thank the Vice Chair for yielding, and Dr. Sharon, thank you for being here. It's always uh, good to see you in our subcommittee. Don't make yourself so scarce now that you know where we are. Um, I do want to emphasize the point that providing that certainty for software developers, providing clarity for industry is, is one of the things that we seek to accomplish today. We want predictability for our providers. There are areas, the, the emerging area of clinical decision support has the ability to transform the practice of medicine in the realm of continuing medical education. Always a challenge for clinicians to meet the requirements that are imposed uh, generally at a state level. But now you also have the new sunshine laws that perhaps may make it harder to keep up uh, with these programs that uh, Otherwise, they'd have the ability to support our doctors. The, the issue is that the lack of careful regulation could end many of these programs before they even begin, and it is a bright future ahead of us, and we want to be certain we do everything to provide that predictability and clarity for our providers and for industry alike. And I'll yield back the balance of the time. Chair, thanks to the gentleman, and now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman, five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mobile uh, medical applications hold incredible, incredible promise for patients and health care providers, potentially reducing costs, improving health care delivery, and saving lives. We should all want to see this in exciting innovation continue. At the same time, we must be cognizant of the need to protect patient safety. So just as we do when it comes to all types of medical devices, we logically uh, look to the FDA uh, to oversee, oversee the safety of these cutting-edge technologies. FDA has been regulating software under its medical device regulatory scheme for decades. At the end of September, FDA issued uh, final guidance regarding mobile medical applications, and I think it struck the right balance. It assures that patients are not placed in harm's way, 
by these medical apps, and they do not uh, apply undue uh, regulatory restraints in the way of innovation. As the FDA says in this guidance, something like a dietary tracking app, which uh, reminds you uh, of uh, a medical appointment or some dietary information, help you follow a diet, that kind of uh, app uh, uh, purports to, uh, uh, that kind of app is certainly one that we don't want FDA to regulate. But an app that tells you whether you have cancer or not, well, that deserves a lot of scrutiny. Because let me give you an example. A group of dermatologists recently published a study of four apps that claim to be able to diagnose melanomas. That's a very serious skin cancer. The dermatologists found that three of the four apps incorrectly classified 30% or more of melanomas as benign when they were actually malignant. Well, that's the kind of device where we want FDA to take a look at. We don't want just to say you don't have to look at, you don't have to be involved FDA. We're going to let people get access to it. We can't tell the American people, buyer beware, when potentially life and death care decisions are at stake. FDA's final guidance should, not, should put to rest any concerns that this agency is interested in a regulatory overreach now or in the future. FDA very reasonably and clearly sets forth the types of mobile medical applications that the agency intends to oversee as well as those it does not. For instance, FDA's guidance says that it intends to look at only those apps that could impact patient safety. At the same time, the guidance specifically states that the agency does not intend to regulate distributors of modal, mobile medical apps like iTunes Store or the makers of smartphones or tablets like, uh, uh, like Apple. Today we have before us a bill it's called the Software Act that attempts to codify, put in law, some of what FDA has set forth in this guidance. And I appreciate the offer of the sponsors of this bill to work on that legislation and talk more about it. But I'm skeptical of the need for legislation in this area at this point in time for a number of reasons. First of all, FDA's guidance was just issued at the end of September. We have barely had an opportunity to see how, it, uh, how it's working out, whether there are instances of burdensome requirements stifling innovation in this area. Uh, it's not appropriate to, leg appropriate to legislate based on unfounded fears of what might happen in the future. Second, by almost all of the accounts I've heard, the guidance has been favorably received by most of the industry. It's written in a clear and concise manner, including a litany of specific examples that provide the regulatory certainty so many in the industry were seeking. And third, as I mentioned, FDA's guidance strikes the right balance between protecting patient safety on the one hand and promoting innovation on the other. As I think we will hear today, the current draft of the Software Act does not strike that balance. This bill upsets that balance. I think there are several examples of me mobile medical apps uh, that uh, I think we all would agree should not be permanently removed from FDA's oversight. But that's exactly what the current draft does. I'm not suggesting this was the intent of the sponsors, but it does illustrate a major concern I have, whether the blunt instrument of legislation is the appropriate tool for regulation of mobile medical apps, given the rapidly changing nature of technology in this area. As we all know, once a law is in place, it's very difficult to change it, and it's exceedingly difficult to craft the perfect legislative language that will preserve FDA's ability to oversee appropriate subsets <coughs> of these changing technologies now and in the years in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. That concludes the opening statements of the members. We have two panels today. Uh, <clears throat> on our first panel, we have Dr. Jeffrey Shuren, Director of the Center for Devices and Radiological Health at the U.S. Uh, Food and Drug Administration. Thank you for coming today, Dr. Shuren. You'll uh, your written testimony will be entered into the record. You'll have five minutes to summarize your testimony. Um, and at this time, you're recognized for five minutes.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today. The use of mobile apps is revolutionizing healthcare delivery and has the potential to transform healthcare by allowing doctors to diagnose patients outside of traditional healthcare settings and help consumers manage their own health and wellness. We are excited about these technologies and have been taking steps to facilitate their development and safe use. Developers of mobile apps have been asking for guidance about which mobile apps are subject to FDA oversight and which are not. Such clarity is critical for attracting investment and accelerating innovation. Recently, we provided that clarity by issuing final guidance. The gist of that guidance is the following. Although many mobile apps pertain to health, of which many may be medical devices, we are only overseeing a very small subset of those mobile apps that are medical devices. We have called that subset mobile medical apps. We believe this pragmatic, narrowly tailored approach will promote innovation while protecting patient safety by focusing on those mobile apps that pose greater risk to patients. Our regulation of software as a medical device and a mobile app is software is based on risk and function, their intended use. A foundational principle is that we treat devices that perform the same function for a patient the same regardless of the platform on which it is used. For example, an electrocardiography device, an ECG machine, that measures heart rhythms to help doctors diagnose patients is still an ECG machine regardless of whether it is the size of a bread box or the size of a smartphone. The risks it poses to patients and the importance of assuring for practitioners and patients that it is safe and effective is essentially the same. That's what our guidance does. It makes clear that if a mobile app is a medical device, specifically it transforms a mobile platform into a medical device like an ECG machine, and we've cleared apps for that, or it is an accessory to a medical device, such as an app that acts as a remote control for a CAT scanner, and it is the kind of function we already regulate. So we've approved it, cleared it, or classified such a device. We would continue to regulate that kind of technology if it is on a mobile platform rather than on a non-mobile platform. A mobile medical app is simply a mobile app that is a medical device and a kind of device we have approved, cleared, or classified. Again, it's not about the platform, it's about the function. An ECG is an ECG. And regulating mobile apps is nothing new for us. In the past 15 years, we have cleared over 75 mobile apps, roughly 20 in the past year. For all other types of mobile apps that meet the regulatory definition of a medical device, we will exercise a policy known as enforcement discretion. This means we do not intend to enforce requirements under the law. In addition, we will exercise enforcement discretion for some functions we have been actively regulating, for example, medication reminders and drug-drug interactions. Taken together, we have focused our priorities and taken a big deregulatory action, the biggest we've taken in over a decade. We received about 130 comments on our draft guidance, which were generally supportive of the approach we proposed, but wanted even more clarity. Therefore, the final guidance keeps the same core policy, but provides clearer explanations and more examples. Also, we clarify that at the request of some of our stakeholders, this guidance does not apply to what has been called clinical decision support software, software to aid a practitioner or patient in making a decision. Instead, we have been asked to and will address clinical decision support software as part of the ongoing effort we have with the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology and the FCC to post a proposed strategy and recommendations on a risk-based regulatory framework pertaining to health IT as required by FIDESIA. As part of this effort, we established a multi-stakeholder working group to provide us on recommendations on what to consider when proposing a framework. The working group gave their final recommendations in September. They recommended they, the FDA explain which forms of clinical decision support software it regulates. They also highlighted the importance of treating function the same across platforms, what we are doing, and recommended that we expedite our guidance on mobile medical apps because of its critical importance in providing clarity. We will provide ongoing clarity to mobile app dividers through a new website to which we will continually post new examples of apps that we are not actively regulating. App developers who have questions can contact us through several means, including a new email address. Queries will be handled by a special team under the guidance of CDRH senior managers. 
Smart regulation by FDA can help promote innovation in mobile apps and protect patient safety. Mr. Chairman, I thank the subcommittee for its efforts. Please answer any questions you may have. The chair thanks uh, the gentleman, and we will now begin questioning. I will recognize myself five minutes for that purpose. Dr. Shuren, the FIDESIA working group produced a report on the issue of regulation of mobile, mobile medical apps and other software. <coughs> Included in the FIDESIA report are problems associated with the challenges faced by FDA related to wellness and disease, accessory issues, post-market requirements for networks, enforcement, interoperability of medical devices, regulatory jurisdiction on converged medical devices, and resource constraints, among other issues. Is that correct? Uh, yes, they did uh, make recommendations pertaining to all of those. And isn't it true that the FIDESIA working group stated there are issues in each area that I just mentioned that are, quote, broken at the written law level, close quote? Um, they did say that. Uh, in reality, from our perspective, many of the things we need to do are about providing clarity in those areas, which is something we intend to do. Now, <clears throat> Dr. Shuren, as the opening statements here today suggest, and in light of reports like the FIDESIA Working Group report, there is a strong role for Congress to modernize the FDA to regulate software and other forms of health information technology because the written law is antiquated and did not take into account such technologies when it was written 30 years ago. Understanding this, did your office reach out to my office or other offices of members on the Health Subcommittee with an offer to work together on this issue before we release the proposed or final guidance? Um, not to my understanding, but um, we've certainly gotten lots of input from the stakeholder committee. It's something we've been working on for roughly two years. Can you tell me why your office did not reach out to offer collaboration on this issue when you knew the important role Congress needs to play in this space? I think in this space we were trying to provide clarity regarding our current authorities, which is what we did. I will tell you that if we certainly felt that at the time there was a need for legislation, we would absolutely have reached out to you. And you've handled, had hearings on this matter before, and we've stated uh, the same previously. But we certainly welcome opportunities to work with you. And I will say it is Congress's prerogative um, to pass legislation. That is, that is certainly your choice to make. Um, we would hope, though, that we have an opportunity to um, engage and certainly point out implications of any legislative path that may be under consideration. Now, Dr. Shearn, you have publicly intimated in the past that the FDA could regulate electronic health records as medical devices. Can the FDA regulate electronic health records as medical devices? Um, arguably, yes, but we have stated on the record and we've put into formal policy that that is not what we are doing. And that is now official policy of the agency. Now, in her testimony on behalf of the FDA to this committee on March 21st, 2013, Christy Foreman said, that the FDA could change its mind tomorrow and regulate items and products not described in its final guidance, products like electronic health records or clinical decision support programs. Uh, Dr. Shearn, do you agree with Christy Foreman that the FDA could change its mind and regulate beyond the FDA guidance it published in September 2013? So I don't know what Christie actually said, but we have now put in place a final policy. I can't change that overnight. There are statutory requirements that we have to comply with to change any such policy, which requires extensive public input on proposals, and there's congressional oversight. Changing policies like that, if there's disagreement within the community, is exceptionally difficult to do. The value, though, of such policies and guidance, and I will tell you that 
we've had extensive conversations during Phasia about the invaluable nature of guidances to provide both predictability and flexibility. Both are critical to industry, particularly an industry like healthcare IT that is rapidly innovating. So our guidance, we spend two years with extensive input, with a public meeting, a proposal, public comment, then final guidance, and that's about 40 pages long with extensive explanations and examples and answering questions. And it gives us the ability that if the healthcare IT community, and it gives them the flexibility, that if they, over time, as their technologies evolve, they feel, you know what, FDA, we want you to make certain changes. We have the ability to do that. The challenge with statute, and it is your call whether or not to do that, mm -hmm. is to take what's a 40-page document and hone it down into a few sentences of statute is not only very challenging, it becomes difficult to make changes to because statute is yeah. so much inflexible compared my to time, My time has expired. I just want to clarify uh, your answer. Can FDA change it, a guidance at any time? It's guidance at any not time. Not overnight. Not overnight. We have to go through a long process. <coughs> Recognize the uh, ranking member, Mr. Plone, five minutes for questions. I wanted to thank Dr. Sharon for being here again. As you know, Representative Blackburn has introduced a bill, H.R. 3303, that would create an entirely new regulatory framework for medical software. It creates uh, three new categories, medical software, clinical software, and health software. The effect of the bill is to remove entirely from FDA's jurisdiction clinical and health software. And if I read the bill correctly, FDA could still regulate so-called medical software, but the bill says that medical software would no longer be considered a medical device, even though FDA could continue to use all of its device authorities to regulate it. Now, supporters of this bill assert that it's essentially an effort to codify FDA's mobile medical apps guidance. So I wanted to ask you briefly, is that what this bill does, and do the two cover the same policies? Quickly, though, because i got a lot of questions for you. Uh, no, this doesn't codify our policy. It takes out from our authority the ability to assure the safety and effectiveness of devices that we currently regulate, including some high-risk devices. All right, now, focusing on the medical software, it appears this category is intended to describe software that is marketed directly to, con to consumers and would make clinical recommendations that could result in the consumer taking some health action in response to that recommendation but without actually seeing a doctor. And that's certainly a type of software I would want FDA to look at, too, but I'm concerned about the way it's drafted and what the actual effect would be. So the question is, are there examples of software FDA currently regulates or would be interested in overseeing that would be excluded by this definition? Um, yes, and um, our read of it, this is not just limited to uh, software for consumers. So. Our read is we would no longer be able to assure safety and effectiveness of blood glucose meters, which measure sugar in the blood and used by diabetic patients and doctors to determine if they need insulin and how much insulin. We've cleared an app for it. Um, we wouldn't be able to assure the safety and effectiveness of software that's used to analyze the pap smear slides and highlight the fields that the healthcare care provider should look at to then screen for cervical cancer. And if we can't assure it's accurate, then those providers may be missing cervical cancer. All right, let me move on. I'm also concerned about what the impact would be of giving this broad set of software a new definition and excluding it from the device definition. Is there any question, is there any precedent for that kind of legislation? And what would the effect be of saying something is not a device, but authorizing FDA to use all of its device regulatory authorities? Um, <coughs> I'm not aware, and I've asked in the agency, we're not aware of any similar case. Um, and it's very confusing to us what this actually accomplishes. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, lastly, I'm not going to have enough time to explore uh, the other two categories Gary's in the bill with you, but hopefully somebody else will. But la let me ask you a more general question. The reason we're even talking about legislation today on the heels of the release of FDA's guidance is that some are apparently concerned that the guidance leaves too much room for chance and is unpredictable. But in the face of what I know is a rapidly changing marketplace, I'm concerned about using legislation as a tool here at all. So do you think it's appropriate to be looking at legislation at this point and you can, s can you say anything to alleviate fears that FDA is going to stray far from this final guidance in the future and begin regulating every mobile app on the market? 
I think uh, that's the concern. Right. Um, like I said, for legislation, it is, it is your prerogative. We want to make sure you understand, uh, from our perspective, the implications, at least for the bill as currently drafted. We think at the present time it may be premature for legislation. If we're going to talk about things that suddenly sh are not regulated and go into a new framework, what is that framework? What's being put in place? And once you draw lines and it's chiseled in stone, we're sort of locked in for a long period of time. Are those the lines then on which you develop a framework around? Now, we're not saying there isn't going to be a need for legislation at some point. There may well be. But we think at the present time, it's just simply premature. Well, what about my last thing, Dr. Yeah, and in terms of The fear guidance. that FDA is going to stray from its final guidance and regulate every mobile app. Yes. No, we are not going to do that. Um, there are a lot of hoops and hurdles for us if we ever go there. And quite frankly, well, let me put a sensitive topic on the table. Laboratory developed tests. I think people know we've been trying to change an enforcement policy. Well, I've been at the agency. We've been trying to change that policy for 15 years years. Um, all right. I don't know if you asked answered my last question, but I guess that's the best I'm going to get, right? The answer is no. We're not going to be going after a whole bunch of other me mobile, mobile apps. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, uh, gentlemen. And now I recognize the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, five minutes for questions. Hey, thank you, Dr. Sherman. We do appreciate that you are here mm -hmm. and look forward to working with you as we continue to go through this process. Uh, let me stay with the framework. And of course, FIDESIA requires that your working group deliver a framework, a regulatory framework, what it would look like, the various agencies where the responsibility would, would lie. And when do you expect that we're going to be able to see that? So I'm expecting, but it won't be our call to make because it will go through administration review. I think it's more reasonable to expect that more in the February time frame. Okay, but so again, I can't make, I'm not the one to make that decision. Do you think we're safe saying first quarter next year? Uh, yes, I think that's realistic. Okay, that's great. And then do you know what the report is expected to say about strengths and weaknesses of the FDA regulating in this space? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the <laughs> the report. You're excused. Um, thank you. I had a teenage moment right there. Um, the report isn't done, so it's hard to comment on on what's in there. But you can anticipate what we're focusing more on are for the things where FDA isn't dealing with technologies. Then what is the framework that should be in place, and where are the areas where are there are additional clarity? Uh, between what the different agencies do that is net should be in place. And I'll tell you, the report will give thinking. It will give proposals. We will be seeking public comment on that before proceeding to even do anything on a framework. So that framework is going to say, here's the proposed policy, give us comment, and we move to final. It's a step before even getting to trying to put formal proposals in place for a framework. So. There's lots of opportunity for input. In fact, we believe it is essential that we are working closely and collaboratively with the stakeholder community in trying to put in place what best meets the needs of the entire stakeholder community, the innovators and patients and practitioners. Okay. Do you think that your framework would require the FDA to modify its approach if uh, – it identifies FDA's some regulatory weaknesses. We'll say it like that. And then would you expect those changes to be big or small? So right now, there's nothing written in stone. Um, what we'll do is we'll put out ideas. We'll get feedback on that. Things may change based upon what we hear back from stakeholders as we move forward. And there are particular areas where um, there's still need for greater clarity that we're going to take the time and attention to work with stakeholders on what final policy should look like. We're not rushing to judgment. We think we need to give it the time and we need to give it the collaboration that's absolutely essential to try to get it right, but also to give flexibility to this community um, and allow the marketplace to evolve. What we worry about is locking ourselves into such a great degree, we end up stifling innovation because we really haven't thought through what will happen in the future. 
We don't know what's going to happen in the future. Do we have the flexibility to account for it as times change and as technology evolves? I think that one thing we can all agree on is we do not want to stifle innovation. And I would appreciate if we can say that is a shared goal and uh, something that we would seek to do. For those of us that have rural areas uh, that are dependent many times upon expanding access to uh, certain health care concepts, um, this, the mobile medical apps plays a tremendously important uh, position in that delivery. So I, I like hearing you say let's not stifle innovation. I think that our uh, community of innovators would appreciate hearing that also. I do think it's important that you conduct impact analysis not only on the industry but on patients. And uh, as you all have worked through this process, are you conducting that type of impact analysis and looking at the expectation of what that innovation can have on the industry and on individuals, on patients? Yeah. So we certainly take into account um, what the impact when, when we're looking at regulating or on the flip side, I'd say not regulating. Uh, particular technologies, we do take that into account. For the framework that everyone's been talking about, that we need a new framework for some of these technologies, um, we're early on for kind of considering what does that look like and what the impact will be, which is why we think it is so critical to have those collaborative efforts with the stakeholders, figure out what to do and understand what the implications are. Thank you. I yield back. Chair, sure. thanks, gentlelady. Now I recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to follow up, Dr. Sherman, with the questions that uh, Mr. Pallone asked you about the effect of this Software Act, this proposed bill, the proposed new law. Uh, I'm too concerned about the notion that uh, we could successfully uh, use legislation to effectively give FDA the tools it needs to assure patient safety when they uh, use these apps, you know, this is a balance. We don't want to stifle innovation, but we don't want patient safety to be at risk. So let me ask you about the two categories that are defined in this bill. One says there's clinical software, and the other part of the bill says there's health software. The bill would completely remove FDA's jurisdiction to even look at both of these newly defined types of software. Now, clinical software is clinical decision support software that captures, analyzes, changes, or presents patients or population clinical data, but does not directly change the structure or function of the body and is intended only for the use by healthcare providers. Health software is software that can also capture, analyze, change, or present patient or population clinical data. It can support administrative or operational aspects of health care, but is not used in the direct delivery of patient care. So that's what's defined in the bill. First, let me ask you an overarching question about both of these categories before I get into specifics about each. Do you see any problems with your existing authority over the apps that these provisions would cover, such uh, that there could be an advantage in putting them into a newly defined categories of unregulated products for which some future regulation would be contemplated? Um, we think one of, the, one of the challenges with suddenly carving out areas, writing them down in statute for the moment, is that in trying to figure out what a new framework looks like, um, you're stuck with those definitions. You're stuck with those categories, and you have to build a framework around those. And it's unclear at this point if those lines are drawn in the best possible way for the most appropriate regulatory framework that facilitates <laughs> innovation while also protecting patients. Mm -hmm. Well, um, they define these categories and say you can't even look at them anymore. Let's look at this clinica, clinical software category. As I read it, it would seem to cover a large swath of software that the um, the guidance that a FDA issued specifically says warrants FDA, uh, FDA oversight. For example, 
It seems to cover mobile apps that perform patient-specific analysis and provide patient-specific diagnosis or treatment recommendations. I want to know if that's your interpretation. Are there examples of software that the bill would explicitly exempt FDA regulation, but that FDA believes raise patient safety issues warranting oversight? Um, yes, it does. Um, and some of those examples we included in our guidance. So, for example, computer-assisted diagnostics or computer-assisted detection devices mm -hmm. analyze uh, radiological images for highlighting what may be cancer, so they can be used on mammograms to help a radiologist determine if there's cancer or not. And if it's inaccurate, if we don't sure it's safe and effective, radiologists may miss cancers or they may send women for inappropriate biopsies. Or radiation therapy planning, which takes patient information and analyzes their imaging studies to come up with what dose of radiation should be given for their cancer. Very complicated analysis that usually took weeks several experts, including a physicist, now done by software, and then that's uploaded to a machine that can deliver the radiation. If that's not safe and effective, then cancer patients don't get the right radiation to their cancer or they get radiation to their healthy tissue. Let me ask you, because I have a limited time, there's a categ category called health software. This seems aimed at excluding software such as electronic health records, which the FDA, FDA guidance already describes as not warranting oversight. Let's say, assume we all agree that FDA should not have authority over electronic health records. But putting aside for a moment whether you think that's a good or a bad idea, could you describe the factors one would have to take into account so as not to inadvertently capture things that truly warrant FDA oversight because of patient safety concerns? Well, certainly in any category, um, let's say we, we do talk about electronic health records. I'll put it on the table. Um, have to be very clear about what are we talking about. Are we talking about electronic version of medical records or are we talking about more? Because software is software. You can combine function, variety of different functions. So you can take what you could call an electronic health record, but I just mentioned computer assisted diagnostics. That can actually be included as software within any other compilation of functions. So you can call up radiological images and apply that analytical software to it. So are we saying that? computer-assisted diagnostics, if FDA were to assure it's safe and effective when it sits as a standalone program on a computer, if I combine it with other functions, suddenly you don't assure it's safe and effective. That doesn't make sense. It's the same risk to patients. Why would we do that? Why do we create arbitrary categories like that? That would be a concern. There can be real complexities of what look like simple definitions. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize gentleman, gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shemkus, five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I appreciate the ranking member of the full committee and, and the subcommittee in, in, these, in this line of questions. Um, but I also was listening to uh, the chairman talk about a question about when was the first time you provided some technical assistance on, legisla on this piece of legislation. And my understanding was, following up with staff, was la late last night was the first time we, they had any of these discussions. So I would ask my, my colleagues still here, uh, uh, Congresswoman Blackburn, are you willing to work with the FDA to try to clean up some of this, this language uh, that might be of concern? Absolutely. And that is why we had uh, contacted them in July and continue to seek to, to work with them. It is about making certain we do not stifle innovation, providing certainty and clarity. And Dr. Shuren, would you then work with Congresswoman Blackburn and the bipartisan group of co-sponsors of this legislation to see if they can recon reconcile some of these language differences? Um, we certainly would be uh, more than happy to work with you. And I will say in terms of a request for, uh, for uh, feedback on uh, legislation. Um, we did provide um, some feedback um, within the agency in July. I don't know whatever came back to you all. And that was on the first version of the bill. The new version of the bill, uh, to my understanding, we were first asked for any kind of feedback late last week. And we did take a look at the bill, and we uh, spoke, I think, with one of your staffers Yeah, well just re re reclaiming my time, I think the point being made is I think you've got the author of the legislation, and we have I think your commitment to work together because uh, there's issues raised by the the ranking member that I think are credible, but it, it is a good piece of bipartisan legisla legislation they worked on 
Mr. Wackman, I you thank like you for time? yielding. I'm always open to discussing matters, but it seems to me there's a threshold question of whether we need legislation at all, and I'm not convinced of that, but I'd certainly be happy to talk. Yeah, to reclaiming you. my time, I'm going to raise one of those issues of why we might need um, legislation, and it goes back to Mr. Pitts's other question. Um, based upon this issue of uh, Christy Foreman's testimony where sh she basically said that uh, that guidance could change. Now, Mr. Pitts's question, question to you was, can that guidance change at any time? And in good bureaucratic form, Dr. Shuren, you said, well, not immediately. Well, that wasn't the question of whether it could change immediately. The question was, could that guidance change? Um, yes, it could change. Okay, and that's that the answer we were, we were trying to get out. But I, I do know that in her testimony she said could change its mind tomorrow, and I think that's probably where you talked about no immediate response. But the point being that that guidance could change, and, and the importance of codifying is that then the law would have to change. Which, which brings us to the point of why the legislation might be important. And, and because in the tech industry, they need, just like any other business, they need some, they need some certainty. And if, because of the, the two additional uh, points that I have would be um, with this is, what would you tell companies who fear the FDA regulation with an imprecise tool like a medical device regulatory tool who fear that regulatory confusion and delay are sure to follow the September 2013 final guidance. You're saying there is none. Is that correct? Well, I'm saying that um, we did provide a lot of clarity in the guidance, and we have a mechanism to continue to build on that. So companies who say, you know what, I'm doing this specifically. I'd like to get feedback from the agency. We'll look at, and quite frankly, no, we shouldn't be dealing with that. We will put that on the website so everyone learns. I okay, let me let me reclaim my time. I've got a minute left, but and I want there are really small companies, and this is how a lot of these, these folks start, as we all know, who are um, being um, maybe the the excitement is being diminished based upon the FDA regulatory regime and the th and and so larger companies. Not that there's any in here in this crowd might be trying to purchase smaller apps or proposals or inventions because of the bureaucratic challenge of getting through the FDA and, and this process. I only put that on the table because uh, we represent constituents and this is what's been raised to us. So I put that just as one of the reasons why certainty might be helpful, more certainty might be helpful than, than less. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the uh, gentleman, Mr. Butterf Butterfield, five minutes for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I won't take the full five minutes. I think my colleagues have covered uh, some of the territory that I intended to cover. Uh, but, but thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Uh, I am one of the six individuals who have been referenced here as sponsors for this bill. I, I think it's important. Uh, I've listened very carefully to this uh, conversation. and certainly understand the concerns that uh, Mr. Waxman and Mr. Pallone have raised. And, and I think uh, it's they're, they're legitimate concerns, and I think we need to work through it through this as we go forward. Uh, but the reason I've signed on to this bill is just because of the explosion of software uh, in this space. Uh, these applications have just exploded over the last 12 to 18 months, and we've got to get some type of regulatory framework uh, to make sure that it does not uh, have unintended consequences. I, I don't want to discourage innovation. Uh, innovation is, is the future, and I want to keep us on, on, the, on the cutting edge, and, and we can do that. And so I pledge to you, uh, to all of you who are stakeholders in this, that, that I will work with you to try to, uh, to come up with a framework that we can all agree on. Uh, speaking of stakeholders, I have uh, in my possession six letters that I've received. Uh, I, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to ask uh, unanimous consent to submit these six letters of support for the Software Act uh, that uh, we have received from the healthcare industry. Without uh, and objection, organization. so ordered. And if I may state for the record, these letters are from uh, Ethna Health, Healthcare Leadership Council, Health IT Now Coalition, Verizon, uh, and uh, IBM, and Applications Developers Alliance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Lance. Five minutes for questions. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I will not take my uh, full five minutes. It's always a pleasure to be with you, uh, uh, Doctor. Um, do, do you know, does the FDA currently have reciprocity agreements with the agencies uh, with which it is working? I know that the Congress has decided that uh, there would be a regulatory framework where no one agency would uh, prevail in all matters. Um, do, do you currently have reciprocity agreements? Um, we have, uh, we do have MOUs in place and office and MOUs. You'll have to tell me what that is. Oh, sorry, memorandum of understanding. Memorandums of understanding. And office of national coordinator is part of health and human services, so that's actually part of, if you will, mm -hmm. one happy family. One happy family. Mm -hmm. Rather like Congress, one happy family. <laughs> um, uh, as an example, if, if an app developer finds a bug in its software that causes a potential patient safety risk, uh, as I understand it, it will typically issue a patch as quickly as possible to fix uh, the functionality. Um, since the threshold for submitting a change uh, is whether the change could significantly affect the safety or effectiveness of the device, uh, wouldn't the FDA require that it review the patch before the developer could release it? And if that's correct, uh, wouldn't that mean that a change that actually improves the safety of the app might be held back for months until approval is received? Yeah, we actually don't generally ask to see those security patches uh, before they're made. In fact, most of the changes in software we don't look at beforehand. Uh, but it is a great point about what you do with software, and you should know that there is currently an international effort underway under the International Medical Device Regulators Forum that you encourage us to be a part of under FIDESIA to develop an international harmonized framework for software as a medical device because all these other countries, they've been regulating software as medical devices for years. And now it's about do we have a common appropriate framework in place? We've been asked by industry to do that, and we are actually working with industry on that. In fact, the U.S. is chairing that effort, and it deals with what do you do when there are changes in software and how best to accommodate the business models of companies that make software but also assure proper patient safety, and that is underway right now. Thank you, Dr. Sher and, and Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm proud of the efforts of the group of original co-sponsors of the Software Act, and this bill has been supported by the Healthcare Leadership Council, the Bipartisan Policy Center, Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, and several others. It is an important first step toward Congress fulfilling our obligation to provide the FDA the tools necessary to do our job. Uh, Dr. Sherman, thank you for being here today, and I'm pleased with the guidance issued by the FDA, and I appreciate all your hard work and leadership. Under this guidance, are most electronic records regulated? Um, under this guidance, we are not regulating electronic health records. Okay. Under this guidance, would mobile apps aimed at diagnosing and prescribing medical care be regulated? Um, certain diagnostic apps, but uh, the ones that are, you know, just certain treatment recommendations, no. But certain diagnostic ones, yes. Okay. And I'm, can you distinguish between those or those, those who are not physicians? <laughs> yeah. So what we've said is the kind of functions we've been regulating all along, we've already approved, we approved devices for that or cleared. Just because they moved to a mobile platform, we would treat them the same. So I mentioned the ECG machine. We have a mobile app for an ECG that doctors can use a smaller smartphone to use to diagnose patients in their office and help determine if someone having a heart attack. We want to make sure it's safe and effective, whether it's a box this big or it's a box that big, it's still the same function. Okay. The FDA is using enforcement discretion to establish a risk-based framework for regulating these products. Is that correct? Um, we're using, we're actually just using enforcement discretion to clarify the kinds of mobile apps that we are not enforcing any requirements. That's it. It's not creating any new framework at all. So future administrations could make different decisions. So in order to do that, the good guidance practice, what, um, the way it works is that there's a very extensive public process to make any changes in it. Um, it is not easily done. It's not done overnight. But the value of it is that things change over time. 
people sometimes come back and say, you know what, we tried this policy for a while, we need new clarity because things have changed. Guidance lets us do that. When we have statute, we can't do that. We're, we don't have that flexibility, guidance does. And one of the things about changes here, what would change? Well, we also said there are certain things we used to regulate it, we're not regulating anymore. We anticipate over time and more input from the community and more experience, there will be more things we say we used to regulate, we don't regulate. We can do that through guidance. That's what enforcement discretion allows us to do. Statute provides limitations. Okay. It appears, though, that virtually all software used in a health setting could be regulated under some administrations and could not under others. Um, I know the discretion helps, but somewhere along the way there needs to be certainty, uh, regulatory certainty, but mostly important could endanger the patient's safety in the future. Um, Dr. Sherman, I commend you and your agency for recognizing your need for clarity and certainty. If clarity and certainty are the goals, why shouldn't we work on legislation? So, you know, as I said before, it is certainly your all prerogative to do so, and if you want to do that, we are very happy to work with you. I just simply put out, put in place what some of the challenges are with statute. There's a desire for predictability and flexibility. Statute, it can give you predictability. It doesn't give you that flexibility to be able to adapt as technologies adapt, as the marketplace evolves, and as stakeholders say, you know what? We need to see some changes. We're able to better accommodate our stakeholders through a guidance mechanism in many cases. We have a statute, and I'm not saying that legislation may not be necessary in the future. All we're saying is it's premature at this point, particularly in not even figuring out what does a new framework look like. And in that respect, maybe the lines drawn go in different places. Maybe at that point there's a need to put something in legislation, or maybe we want something out there and get experience with it first before we've decided whether or not we got it right. Because if we got it wrong, it is much harder to change statute than it is to change guidance if necessary, but it is not easy to change guidance either. You know, believe me, we understand that. Uh, but the concern I have is that we need to have both. We need to have some flexibility with the FDA, but also certainty to industry and everyone else that they know what the FDA is doing. And uh, if uh, FDA should want certainty that comes from updated regularly, uh, regular authority through legislation, and if not um, uh, the right time, how will we know when the right time is to start after a public health crisis? And again, our committee just dealt with compounding uh, because in the first hearing did not show very good on the local, and uh, uh, you know, pharmacy agency in Massachusetts or the FDA. And so we put together a bill that, again, nothing's perfect, we do, but that actually gave the FDA that authority, discretion, but certainty in the dis authority of it. Uh, right. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I know I'm, on, I'm out of time. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. And now I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bilirakis, five minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it very much. Thanks for holding this hearing as well. Thank you, Doctor, for your testimony. Uh, first question, uh, Dr. Shuren, under the rules you uh, issued, FDA said it, it would have enforcement discretion on many commonly used applications. For example, uh, abscess service video conferencing portals specifically intended for medical use and to enhance communications between patients and caregivers. Also apps specifically intended for medical uses that utilize a mobile device built in camera or a connected camera for purposes of documenting or transmitting pictures to supplement or augment uh, what would otherwise be a verbal description. Uh, description. This sounds like FDA reserves a right to regulate Skype, webcams, iPhones, and tablet PCs. There are many off-the-shelf software solutions that can be used or adopted uh, into telemedicine, as you know. Had you draw the delineation, delineation of a program specifically intended for medical use? Yeah, so actually the, the tablets, the tablets themselves and the video com cameras and all that, those aren't even medical devices. I don't even view them as medical devices. The issue has come up when someone develops software and they use the, the smartphone, let's say, the person developing the software that suddenly gives it a, a medical function. So I mentioned the ECG. Um, another one is ultrasound. People use sound waves to look at abnormalities in the body, so we have cleared an app that is an ultrasound. It takes kind of a mobile platform and it turns it into a medical device. The maker of that platform is not a 
manufacture of medical devices, no responsibility on their part. The software, though, is the issue. And the challenge there is, and, the, and as this bill is currently drafted, the problem for us is we wouldn't be able to assure that that software is safe and effective. And it's used by, um, sorry, Dr. Burgess isn't here, an obstetrician to use on women who are pregnant to look for fetal abnormalities. And in this case, we wouldn't be able to assure that this is going to be accurate technology when a doctor uses it to, die, to make sure the fetus is healthy or not healthy. Those are the things that we're talking about. But a basic uh, tablet, it's by itself, it's not even a medical device. Even if it's used for medical purposes? No, that itself isn't. The software maker then is actually taking that tablet and as part of it is now using it as a medical device. The software maker then, whoever's putting that together, they're the ones who have now put out a medical device through their software. The person who made the tablet, Apple, is not a device manufacturer, and that's what we've said. Okay, in the, in the uh, mobile medical app guidance, mobile platforms are defined to include smartphones, again, tablet computers, or other portable computers. Is a laptop considered a portable computer? It's a portable computer, and we don't regulate laptops. And what I got to tell you, I don't want someone regulating my iPad. I like my iPad. What about a desktop? A desktop is a computer, right? Not is considered a, a portable computer? Uh, no. Okay. And, what? and what you're highlighting is what has really changed over time is that you have a lot of the same functions, but you didn't have the capability to make tiny computers. That's the way the world changed. I had things years ago, they were on a desktop. And then the laptop came along. We had the PCs. And now they can be on small smartphones. They're computers. And the value is that they can play a variety of different software. Manufacturers don't have to make the hardware anymore because they now have ubiquitous hardware that a software maker can simply take advantage of. That's the way the world has changed. And all we're saying is the functions, when they stay the same, treat them the same because the impact and the risk to patients are the same. Simply because it got smaller and I can pick it up and walk out of the room with it doesn't change the risk to patients. Why, for that reason alone, would we simply treat it differently? Okay, I've heard uh, some, uh, including staff at uh, the FDA, suggest that the FDA move to regulate mobile medical apps will give industry and patients more certainty. Can we really say that enforcement discretion gives health IT developers and investors any certainty or clarity if the FDA can indicate that it may, that it may have the discretion uh, to change its policy. Uh, is that the case? In other words, can we, instead of, because the FDA has a discretion, how does that give the industry or developers any certainty? Because there are safeguards in place to actually change that discretion. As I mentioned, there are a lot of statutory requirements for us to go through under good guidance practices with putting out pr proposals, public comment, and congressional oversight um, before we can make any kind of changes. So it is not a simple thing for us to do, particularly when there's disagreement on it. But in a number of cases, we have our constituents come and ask us to change guidance because the times change and they want updates. And the guidance lets us do that. That is the value of it. And we hear time and time again for our industry how much they want guidance because it gives them both predictability and flexibility. That's why we've been increasing our guidance production, because we've been asked to do that by our industry. They find it of tremendous value. Okay, thank you. I yield back the balance. Chair, thanks thank you, to the gentleman, and now recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, five minutes for questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Dr. Sherman, very much. I think this is a very exciting area, all of the uh, advances in health information technology. I've seen um, it help boost small businesses uh, back home and uh, create business opportunities ac across my community in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, I think that the mobile apps hold great promise in improving uh, people's health, uh, also empowering consumers and individuals, and uh, providing more efficient tools for medical professionals. Uh, now, the 2012 FDA Safety and Innovation Act, FDASIA, directed FDA to work with the Office of, National, of the National Coordinator of Health IT and the FCC 
to propose a strategy and recommendations on an appropriate risk-based regulatory framework pertaining to health information technology, including mobile medical applications that promote innovation, protects patient safety, and avoids regulatory duplication. FIDESIA requires the working group of the three agencies to report to Congress by January of 2014. Dr. Shern, can you tell us what steps the three agencies have taken so far in developing that report and the extent to which outside stakeholders have been, uh, have had an opportunity to pro provide input into the development of that report? Oh, certainly. Um, we constituted a multi-stakeholder working group, so representatives from all different parts of the ecosystem under the Office of National Coordinators Health IT Policy Committee. And they spent time and they got a lot of public input uh, along the way. They put out draft recommendations. They got public input on that and provided it to us. We have gotten a lot of input from the stakeholder committee, uh, community, both from that working group and from other meetings and venues in which we have participated. And that's helping to inform the report that we will uh, make available to Congress and we'll make available to the public. And as I had mentioned, we will get public comment on that before even proceeding to put out proposals for anything that would go into a regulatory framework. So trying to have a very thoughtful process and moving forward. And are you forward. satisfied that the participation has been very diverse? Do you, are small businesses adequately represented? Are academics represented uh, the larger uh, corporations. Has everyone had uh, an opportunity? Is there enough balance in what you've heard so far? Um, we, th we think there has been. Um, I'm sure you can always hear from people who said, wow, I wish I'm in the room and I'm part of a committee. Then you have a committee of thousands. So it's always challenging. But in spite of that, there are publicly available dockets for people to provide information. There are meetings where any member of the public could come and to talk. And of course, people can always request to talk to us Directly, we talk to lots of people who want to have those conversations, and we do so. So are you still on track for January 2014? Um, I'm Did anticipating it's going to be a little bit later, um, in all fairness. Um, we have the recommendations from the working group came in September, and we had the government shutdown, so some people were not around working on things. It adds a little bit more time. That's why I say more likely February 1st, certainly the first quarter, but the final decision after it goes up to review will be made by others. But our goal is to get it as close to that line. And do you think it's can. important uh, for the Congress to have the benefit of those recommendations before we consider whether or not to legislate in this area? Um, we do, uh, because we've got a wealth of information to provide back. And uh, like I said, Congress can decide at any moment if you all want to pass legislation. It's your discretion to do so. We'd like to make sure that any decisions made are with full information. and then. I think there'll be value coming from the report. In fact, may even feel that at that point, additional comment, we think there'll be need for a lot more input from stakeholders uh, before even sort of figuring out exactly what a framework looks like um, and what the pieces are, and even then delving a little bit deeper into the specific aspects of it, because this is complicated. I mean, it was hard enough even drawing lines that we did in guidance that's 40 pages long that's just simply about things that are in or out for FDA, nothing about stuff that's out, how you treat them. And we knew that was a two-year process. Um, but how important stakeholders felt it was to have the opportunity to provide input and really think it through. Um, and all we're sort of asking is sometimes moving quickly to judgment leads to unintended consequences that can be very hard to undo once they're done. And that's all we're really trying to put on the table. We share your desire to promote innovation, and we share your desire to protect patients. We want to see this field flourish. We're jazzed up about a lot of the technology. We want it to happen. We want it to happen right. Um, and that's why we're moving about in, in the way that we're doing it and trying to do it in a very collaborative fashion. Good. I look forward to, to reading the report early next year. Thank you. Chair, thanks. The uh, gentlelady now recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Guthrie, five minutes for questions. Thank you. Hey, thank you for coming back today. I appreciate you being here. Um, as I've talked to different people who provide apps, and, and I know you said we don't, we don't intend to regulate or, or iPads. It's the apps that go on the iPads. Uh, the, and depends on what that app is that goes on the iPad. And, and I'm not an attorney, but I have one law school class. And I know the exams are always not Black or it was always where in the middle. That's the questions they always ask, and, and where does the gray intersect each other? 
And, and so just kind of, and they would give you scenarios. I was just uh, looking through a scenario that people had brought to my attention, and, and I'll be slow so you can uh, follow, but it says, among the mobile apps for the FDA intends to exercise enforcement discretion are mobile apps that perform simple calculations routinely used in clinical practice. So according to the FDA, these apps are intended to provide a convenient way for clinicians to perform various simple medical calculations taught in medical schools and are routinely used in clinical practice. And, it, and so the question is, while dosing calculators are not listed among the examples, if a specialist routinely prescribes a certain drug to patients, would an app that calculates the proper dose be considered not regulated, or would that app be considered one that performs sophisticated analysis uh, and therefore is regulated? Yeah, so we actually think, you know, a lot of those actually would not be regulated. And this is why we kind of ask and why we created this mechanism for people who then have questions say, well, here's what we're looking to do. Is this the kind of thing that you approve clear clarity or something you're now exercising new enforcement discretion to? Because in the past, we regulated that as a medical device. We had a classification for it. Mm -hmm. and now we're saying we're no longer doing it. And those are the cases where, particularly as we expand enforcement discretion and clarity around it, we want people to ask us, and we'll put those examples on our website. But, you know, there are other kinds of- You can of get preclearance if they're going, because it makes a decision on your investment according to where you think the time is going to take to be improved. Oh, yes. Yeah, and we've so. actually provided that for um, developers for years. They've always had the opportunity to come and ask. Here we're trying to have a much more streamlined mechanism to get feedback um, to developers very quickly and let them know and give them the kind of certainty to look for. But when you draw a line, think about even statute, in a few sentences, that's still very broad. The question is, what does it mean? And then even with a bill, we're going to have to move forward and interpret that and provide clarity around that. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be additional questions about, well, what did that mean? And we'll go through the same kind of exercise. There will always be these issues of, does this mean I'm in or I'm out? And we will always be in a position of having to provide that kind of clarity. Because that would be very helpful that, that you're going down that, that path. And actually, I was gonna kind of continue that application, but I think that the answer will be the same. It depends, you'll have to get preclearance when you move forward down that path, so. Yeah, and you don't need preclearance because if you went out there on the market and we saw and you said, yeah, you're the kind of stuff we're not touching, that's fine. You don't have to come to us. Right. We offer it as a service. If you want to come ask us, we can do that. We provide even an email address to send it in. And I'll tell you, for these that are coming in um, where there's any kind of question about it, it actually, it comes up to a group. I sit on that group. We're actually meeting this week, and we have questions that come in and we're answering them. Yeah, I guess I understand on preclearance. So I just have a, an app on my phone that calculates how far, I, if I walk to the Washington Monument back, it calculates my heartbeat and whatever that type of thing. Or if I have an app on my phone that radio, I don't, I don't have diabetes, but if I had a diabetic pump and it regulated that, that's obviously clearly would have to be regulated. I guess the question when people start getting, um, you know, example, uh, one I had is, is if I was gonna go through, maybe I should like, um, Look, you wouldn't ref you wouldn't regulate if it was just downloading the physician's desk reference, and I just had that on my phone instead of in a book. So you don't regulate the book. But I will go through the example. I got a minute then. I had an example of Coumadin, uh, a blood thinner that could call that could cause major or, or fatal bleeding. The full prescribing information in the physician's desk reference gives a list of patient-specific factors that impact the proper dosing of Coumadin, and you, since this information has been used by in the mitigation treatment or prevention of a facilitating by facilitating professional assessment of, of a specific patient, should it be in different category of apps? And, and the MMA guidance is inconsistent on how the FDA, FDA intends to oversee dosing information. So uh, they can kind of blur the lines. Yeah, and we're, kind of, well, we're kind of moving towards the place of a lot of the dosing information, it's kind of taking a step back and letting a lot of that happen. Um, that's That's actually, we're already doing that, and I'm anticipating we can do more, but then we talked about dosing for radiation and how complex a calculation that is, and that's one where it's not so simple. Someone can't figure it out very themselves with paper and pencil, if you will, very quickly. That can take weeks. Got a physicist, radiation oncologist. That's the kind of dosing, so if you just did blanket any kind of dosing, you'd sweep that in. Those are the kinds of challenges, but I'd say even with statute, you will always have issues on boundary lines and a s seeking for clarity because I'll tell you, with the law we have today on any variety of different areas, we are always providing a different clarity to people. It's just a question of do you draw a line that locks you in and still have to provide the clarity or do you give flexibility to a community that itself is evolving and we don't know what the future will look like. 
should we tell people your future's locked in today? Or do we want to let the community have the ability to let the marketplace evolve? And we'd like to see the marketplace evolve. Thank you, I yield. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. Now recognize the gentlelady from Virgin Islands, Dr. Christensen, for five minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Dr. Sharon. Um, so we've heard a lot so far about the substance of the guidance. FDA recently issued all that went into developing it and how you're working with the developers and that's really been helpful. But I think it'd be useful to have some more context and started to follow up on, on my colleague's last set of questions. So I'd like to ask you about the background and history of FDA's oversight on software generally. Your testimony mentions the fact that FDA has been regulating medical device software for decades and medical device software on mo mobile platforms for more than 10 years. This would, I'm sure, surprise many people because software is not typically thought of as being a medical device. So could you explain to us how software can be a medical device, again, under the Food and Drug Co Cosmetic Act? Obviously, you don't regulate all software. It also would be helpful if you could give us, you gave us some examples of where you've regu exerted regulatory oversight. Um, but c some examples of software that you might have begun with decades ago and things you're looking at today. Um, uh, certainly. So, um, you know, the device definition was, was written broad um, with the idea that it's in place to allow for changes in technology over time. So um, how it becomes a device is because it's intended for use in diagnosis of disease or conditions or treatment, cure, mitigation of disease. Um, and not doing so primarily by chemical action. It's chemical action if it's a, it's a drug, not chemical action. can be a device. And it's the same approach, by the way. Other countries also have that broad definition, which allows them to handle new technologies as they come up. Um, we have technologies now that are moving to mobile platforms. So another one is fetal monitoring. Um, we have now an app for that. And this is typically used on women who have a fragile pregnancy to monitor for fetal contraction, for uterine contractions, fetal heart rate, and determine is, um, is the fetus in distress? It's used in hospitals for that purpose. Our concern is under the bill as currently drafted, we wouldn't be able to assure that's safe and effective. What's on the horizon? Diagnostics, lots of diagnostics are all gonna be on mobile platforms. Mm -hmm. um, the XPRIZE just put out a challenge to develop a tricorder. Now I'm a Trekkie, so remember Dr. McCoy had what was probably the first mobile medical app in history. He had a tricorder, and he would wave this little handheld thing over the body and he'd make a diagnosis. Well, the XPRIZE Foundation put out a challenge for that to actually have technology diagnose diabetes and stroke and heart disease, and guess what? Today, that technology is gonna become a reality because there are ways of measuring things in the blood without taking your blood. Right. And they approached us because they said, this, these are medical devices. We gotta make sure it's safe and effective. Will you work with us to provide guidance to these developers? And we're doing this. This is a partnership. I'd love to see a tricorder. Can you imagine Star Trek in reality? <laughs> it's like a kid's dream come true. That's the future. Um, but we wanna be there to help the future. And we'd be concerned on anything in legislation that doesn't provide those assurances for patients. And, and so would I. Um, it's uh, so obviously FDA has had a lot of experience in this space and that's really very reassuring. <coughs> Um, and medical devices, they fall into t different tiers, tier one, tier two, and tier three, of course. Class one devices are the least risky, and three are the riskiest. Can you briefly elaborate on these three levels of device oversight and the responsibilities a device manufacturer has under each of these levels? Um, certainly. So class one is our lowest. That's low risk. Uh, we don't review those going on the market. And about 50% of devices on the market today are probably class one. And they have to have labeling. Um, they have to report certain serious problems to us. So we're, you know, we have some surveillance. And they have to do something called quality systems. Some people call it good manufacturing practices, but engineering, we call it quality systems. And it's having the practices and procedures in place to assure you make a quality product. And this is actually a linchpin in making good products. And we believe the future, by the way, in software really focuses much more on quality systems and a post-market approach to many things. And that's what's under discussion in this international effort. Class two are moderate risk, and 
in addition to what I talked about for requirements, we do see them beforehand. In that case, we do a comparison. Are they substantially equivalent to other technologies on the market? That's 510K. And the very high risk class three, we then ask for studies to show are they in fact safe and effective. So we have a very risk-based approach. As I mentioned though, all of this will be is looking at being modified for purposes Just of software. Me. Exactly, and that's the same we're doing with Europe, Canada, Australia, Japan, China, Russia, and we have the Asian Harmonization Working Party, which if they agree to, will bring in other countries in Asia, the Middle East, and Africa into one harmonized framework. And, and thank you. Chair, sure, thanks, gentlelady. Now I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, five minutes for questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and I apologize that I was not here earlier. I'm working in another committee as, or subcommittee as well. Uh, Doctor, I understand your hesitation about uh, setting things in stone, especially considering how quickly this industry is evolving. However, the medical industry as a whole is evolving quickly, as you know. Your comments beg the question whether Congress should ever legislate in this space. Our goal here is to carefully craft legislation that sets your authority in stone, but does so in a flexible manner that provides you the authority for effective regulation of the industry. My colleague, Mr. Green, in his opening statement mentioned the issues that arose during the meningitis outbreak. Throughout the investigation and legislative process that followed uh, that outbreak, we learned that the FDA felt it lacked regulatory clarity and authority. We all want to make sure that the FDA is in a position to regulate effectively and confidently. I appreciate Mr. Green bringing up this uh, comparison because it is an incredible lesson we learned about the importance of FDA authority and making sure that the FDA understands uh, what its authority is. Throughout the hearing, we have heard from everyone the promise of health IT technology. We know that this industry is growing and holds enormous potential. You would agree, wouldn't you, that we have an opportunity to set a sound regulatory foundation for such pivotal technology? Uh, for Congress to do that, it is always Congress's discretion to pass legislation, absolutely. And, and one of the concerns that I've had, and I'm so glad that, this, that we have this bill as a vehicle to work on these areas, is that uh, when we had a previous witness in testifying, I brought out my cell phone. I've now got a newer version that does more things by about five-fold than my old one did. And I brought out my cell phone and said, hey, here's the problem. A group of scientists in Africa working with people in Canada and the United States and Switzerland, I believe, came up with an $8 hack onto a cell phone that allowed them to take uh, high resolution pictures of uh, fecal material and folks in the United States were then telling them what parasite was affecting the village in Africa. I said, is that going to be considered a, if we were to try to use something like that in the United States, would that be a medical device? And the lady said, yeah, I believe it would be because it's diagnostic. An $8 hack on a cell phone is, is a way that we can bring a lot of innovation into diagnostics, et cetera, and particularly when, and I represent a largely rural district in Virginia, and I had one of my hospitals recently closed down, and we're hoping that we can rectify that, but now I've got folks who have to travel 45 minutes to get cardiac care. Sure would be nice if we had some high-tech fixes, and they're on, the, they're on the verge of being there where my folks could hook up directly with the doctor if that technology were readily available, and, and I'm just afraid the FDA may slow it down by having too much. So don't you think something like this bill is necessary? Um, so, so in, in all honesty, um, we don't believe such a bill is necessary or certainly at this time. Um, and part of the issue, the difference with compounding, in the compounding case, FDA came back and said there's not clarity, to my understanding, clarity in the law, we needed clarity. Here we think we have the authority. We're using enforcement discretion to, if you will, adapt to changing technology. I'll say that example with, um, with stool, no, we wouldn't be regulating that. We just had that with melanoma. You know, if you take a picture of the skin and you're sending it to a doctor, no, we're not touching that. But software that's analyzing that melanoma, we just ran into it with an app developer who sold it to, pay, to uh, consumers and said, look, use this on your skin lesion. You have a concern. We'll tell you if it's high risk or moderate risk or low risk. And if it's high risk, we recommend you go see a doctor. And if it's moderate or low risk, you just monitor it. Not go to see your doctor, monitor it. And guess what? When researchers at University of North Carolina looked at it, it was accurate in finding melanoma one out of 10 times. Nine out of 10 times it missed it. It was telling patients, don't go see your doctor, monitor it. 
That is a diagnostic, and that is the kind of stuff we should be concerned about. Well, and I, and I understand that, but I also risk, there's also the risk that if we don't get things out there onto the marketplace that people may, may miss something because those people who got that test, even with its low accuracy rate, may not have been planning to go see a doctor anyway, and some of them, one out of ten at least, did go see the doctor. Now, I'd prefer it if obviously they didn't uh, have a, a false read, and, and that is an issue that has to be taken up. Yeah, um, and, and those folks obviously downloaded the app because they were interested in looking at some suspicious skin lesion. Again, we're not looking to hold up technology. I'll say the feedback we had gotten on the guidance is for the most part, you know, you got the line in a good place. I mean, and we were trying to get to that point of providing the, the clarity that people are seeking. It's not easy. Whichever way we do it, statute, guidance, or whatever, it is not, it is not easy to draw perfectly clear lines. And that's why it took two years to even yeah. get to where we were. And, and, but two years is a long time. I do appreciate it, and I'm hearing the signal that my time is up, and therefore, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee, Dr. Burgess, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, Mr. Chairman, and again, Dr. Sharon, thank you for, for being with us today. Um, <clears throat> back in my opening statement, I talked a little bit about clinical decision support. And back in my day, that meant a uh, Merck manual in the pocket of your white coat as you went down to the emergency room. Um, but now it can be so much more real time and it can be up to date. And it, it really, in my opinion, is one of those things that could really transform the way doctors practice. Do you agree with that? Um, I do agree with that. And we actually think for clinical decision support, and this is why we've been asked to provide clarity in that area, but we were asked to give more time and do it as part of this other process and a regulatory framework. We do think a lot of those things are not the stuff that FDA would be touching. Um, even things, IBM, I'm glad they're here. Things they're doing with Watson paths we've seen and they're going through data and pull. Those are not the stuff that we're touching. We think that is terrific. But the way people start, then the question is how do you define? So even the bill today, which again, as drafted, draws a line that actually cuts out things like the computer assisted diagnostics that even the same groups that have said, oh, maybe we would like statute, those are exactly the examples of what they say FDA should regulate. And that's what we kind of mean about we're drawing the lines on this. We want to make sure the kinds of things that we should be looking at, we at least have the ability to do that to assure for doctors and patients are safe and effective. And the other things we're not going to touch. Well, that's but our idea. Do you see where there is a concern that uh, as long as there's some ambiguity as to whether or not you might regulate it in the future, it leaves them with the ambiguity of not knowing how to proceed on the development side? I would say typically for folks who have dealt with us um, and understand how we use our policies. Be and careful. I've dealt with you. I know you've <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, that, uh, <laughs> see, you even caught me off guard right there. Thank you so much. Um, that being able to make those changes is not something that can be done on a dime. And that's why for folks who have dealt with this, understand that, yes, we actually do have a level of certainty. In fact, what they tend to ask for is more guidance and more clarity as opposed to please don't use guidance to clarify for us. But I mean, it, it, it is a little bit of a different world than the, than the typical, typical drug device world in which you have historically regulated. Is that a fair statement? Um, yes, but one of the things that's happened here in terms of where we're looking, we didn't move out into someone else's space and say, you know what, we're coming out to reach new stuff. What has happened is developers who weren't making things in the healthcare space and FDA, typical kind of FDA regulated functions, started to say, well, now we're gonna go do that. And what they did is they kind of moved into a world we've been dealing with. And for them, it became, ooh, we don't know the FDA. We hear things, we're concerned. So we didn't reach out to actually expand our universe. If anything, in our guidance, we've been contracting it. But we have new players, and this has happened before in other times. New people come in, they have uncertainty about us. And that's why we're going through this extensive effort to engage with folks and provide the clarity so that we think over time, the people who aren't used to dealing with will realize, oh, now we get it, we're good. Well, that's but that exactly will take time. That's exactly the point. The developers who, are, who, who have uncertainty about 
dealing with you. How can we provide them the, the stable footing they need to proceed with their, we want them to proceed with their developments. I mean, this is the, this is the golden age of medicine that stretches in front of us. So we want them to proceed. How, how do we give them the certainty that they can be sure-footed in, in traveling down that road? Um, by doing what the health IT working group, the multi-stakeholder groups, asked us to do, to continue to provide that clarity through guidance in other areas like clinical decision support, in accessories on certain claims. And that's what um, you are likely to see in the report we send up to you all, is saying these are the things that we should do. We should follow up on those recommendations and put out that clarity through guidance as we've been asked to do. Well, I apologize I wasn't here, but apparently Representative Lance asked you about the, uh, the updates to apps that uh, the apps that the FDA does regulate. Um, the up, you know, it, it seems like my iPad or iPhone is always telling me I've got to update my apps. So everyone's familiar with the fact that apps have to be updated. Are you regulating the updates to the apps as well? Yeah, so most of the kinds of updates we see to so software we don't even look at coming in the door. And um, I mentioned, too, there is an international effort underway for international harmonization on how software as a medical device is approached, and that includes modifications. And this is a collaborative effort between government and industry. So all of this is included. This is an evolving area. It's another way, reason why, too, some of these things we're not locking in at all because it's evolving. Those discussions are happening, and we want to get to a place where we and Europe and Canada and Australia, China, Russia, Japan, and elsewhere are treating all, are acting in the same way, have harmonized approaches. Because we think that ultimately is in the best interest of everybody. That means a technology treated, a software in the U.S. gets treated the same in Europe. We'd love to see that happen, and that's what we're working on. And that includes modifications. Well, I wish I shared your, your certainty, but thank you, Mr. Chairman. You've well, been kind. I'll yield back. Consider it enthusiasm rather than certainty at the moment. Okay, the chair thanks the gentleman. That concludes the questions uh, from the members. Uh, the members may have follow-up questions we ask. Uh, we'll get them to you in writing. Ask you to please respond promptly. To confirm what I heard from you today, Dr. Shearn, you have committed to work with Representative Blackburn and her colleagues, and I would ask that you, your assistance, uh, collaboration be responsive and timely. And um, <clears throat> before I introduce uh, our second panel, thank you, Dr. Shearn, for uh, all of your responses, your testimony. I ask unanimous consent to include in today's hearing record a letter from AdvaMed which includes their comments on H.R. 3303 and issues related to regulation and health information technology without objection, so ordered. With that, you're dismissed, and I'll call the second panel to the table. We have five witnesses, and I'll introduce them as they come and the staff sets up. First, uh, Mr. Mike Marchlick. Vice President, Quality Assurance and Regulatory Affairs, McKesson, uh, McKesson Technology Solutions. Mr. Jim Bialik, Executive Director, Newborn Coalition. Uh, thirdly, the Honorable Zachary Lemnios, Vice President, Research Strategy, IBM Research. Fourth, Mr. Robert Jaron, Senior Director, Government Affairs, Qualcomm Incorporated. And finally, Dr. J. Leonard Lichtenfeld, Deputy Chief Medical Officer of the American Cancer Society. Thank you all for coming. Uh, your written testimony will be entered into the record. Uh, you'll each be given five minutes to summarize your testimony. And uh, Mr. Marsh Marchlick, we'll start with you. You're recognized for five minutes to summarize. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the subcommittee. My name is Michael Marchlick. I am Vice President of Quality Assurance and Regulatory Affairs for McKesson Technology Solutions. Today, I'm speaking on behalf of more than 15,000 technology employees. Together, we are transforming healthcare from a paper-based system to one empowered by interoperable electronic solutions. Our focus is to improve patient safety, reduce the cost and variability of care, and advance healthcare efficiency. McKesson strongly supports H.R. 3303, the Software Act, this bipartisan legislation recognizes that a 40-year-old statute should be updated to reflect innovation and the importance of health IT. 
Prior to joining McKesson, I spent 30 years as a quality and regulatory professional in the medical device and nuclear industries. This experience gave me a unique perspective on effective risk-based regulatory frameworks, as well as how traditional medical device manufacturing differs from health IT development. At McKesson, I have faced the challenge of applying a 40-year-old law to technology that did not even exist four years ago. FDA rules are designed for physical devices which undergo slower incremental changes and longer development cycles where a focus on manufacturing processes makes sense. That environment is markedly different from software where improvements, updates, and patches are made available in a matter of days. The Software Act creates a regulatory framework that acknowledges the difference between medical devices and health IT, recognizes the different categories of health IT, and focuses FDA oversight on the technology that poses a greater potential risk to patient safety. This legislation is the culmination of many efforts to address how health IT should be regulated in the 21st century. Under the auspices of the Bipartisan Policy Center, BPC, I represented McKesson in working with more than 100 hospital, physician, and patient organizations to develop recommendations for a new risk-based regulatory framework for health IT. In a March hearing before the subcommittee, my colleague, Dr. Jackie Midas, testified that health IT is foundational to improving the quality, safety, and affordability of health care. She emphasized that a new risk-based regulatory framework distinct from medical device regulation and specific to health IT is necessary. We believe that the Software Act is a critical step forward to achieving that vision. The Software Act establishes three distinct categories of health IT, medical software, clinical software, and health software. Medical software acts directly on a patient without the ability of a clinician to intervene. Clinical software, by contrast, does not act directly on the patient, but rather informs the clinician's treatment of the patient. Health software is used by clinicians not to treat patients, but rather to schedule appointments, process claims, and analyze data. Under the Software Act, medical software would continue to be regulated by the FDA. Clinical software would be subject to a new oversight framework developed by Congress and the administration, and health software would not be subject to additional patient safety regulation. These three software categories are consistent with both the principles described in the BPC report as well as historic FDA software guidance. FDA has little expertise in clinical software development and implementation and does not regulate the practice of medicine, nursing, or pharmacy where software is ultimately customized and used. That's why we believe that clinical software requires a new regulatory framework that reflects, first, the dynamic nature and rapid innovation of health IT, Second, the shared responsibility among health IT vendors and providers who developed, configure, and use the systems. The Software Act will update current law to provide clarity on how best to ensure patient safety while promoting innovation and broad adoption of health IT. It replaces non-binding FDA guidance and enforcement discretion with the certainty needed by the highly innovative health IT industry. In conclusion, we urge Congress, first, to pass the Software Act which is critically important to setting the guidepost for a new policy. Second, to provide oversight to the administration when implementing this policy. And third, to continue to work with stakeholders to establish the effective risk-based framework to appropriately regulate cutting-edge health IT. On behalf of McKesson, I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of this legislation and commend the sponsors for your leadership. I'm happy to answer your questions. Chair, sure, thanks, gentlemen, and now recognizes the gentleman, Mr. Bialik, five minutes for a summary. Chairman Pitt, Ranking Member Pallone, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on this very important issue. My name is Jim Bialik. I'm the executive director and co-founder of the Newborn Coalition. The Newborn Coalition is an all-volunteer organization that works domestically and internationally to promote the development and safe and effective use of health technologies for newborns. This hearing is very timely, and it is appropriate that Congress takes a deeper look into the many complexities of our regulatory system, identifies the limits of what can be improved administratively, and determines where legislative action is necessary. To argue that Congress does not have a role in reforming the way technology is regulated is to say that regulators already have all of the tools they need to be effective in fulfilling their statutory mandates. While I recognize that some have come to know the existing regulatory process better than others, the agencies themselves have identified that there are a number of barriers to effectively regulating health information technology that are broken at the level of the written law. 
This means that even if the agencies wanted to fix the problem, legally they could not, and Congress has to intervene. To me, there's little certainty in doing nothing, especially when doing nothing means not addressing problems that the regulators themselves say they have, and especially when doing nothing is at the expense of those regulators fulfilling their statutory mandate of protecting patient safety, inclu including the stakeholders I represent, which are our newest and most vulnerable citizens. Technology such as mobile apps are playing a central role in transforming our healthcare system, but their impact will be muted unless there is a concerted effort to clarify how products will be regulated. Efforts across regulators must be coordinated and shift the way we think about medical devices away from discrete products to a focus on the highest risk components of integrated networks of medical devices and consumer products. The line between medical and consumer devices has been blurred by the evolution of this dynamic marketplace and only Congress can bring the needed clarity to the process. In my written testimony, I lay out seven recommendations from the Newborn Coalition perspective on action Congress and the administration can now put in place, uh, can take now put in place a framework that will scale with the needs of the marketplace while keeping patient safety paramount. Among those recommendations are the following. First, we recommend that Congress should create a bright line that defines FDA's authority over high-risk medical devices. Enforcement by discretion, by definition, is discretionary and will need to be constantly updated to address emerging technologies. Our disagreement, who, who, uh, our disagreement with those who believe regulation by guidance, such as the FDA guidance on mobile medical applications, creates certainty, is we believe that that certainty will evaporate as technologies evolve and the process will have to begin anew. Six members of this committee have sought to address this issue head on with the Software Act. We support these efforts <coughs> for being among the first to recognize that technology regulation should shift away from the assumption that novel use of medical device data constitutes a new device acknowledge that technology will continue to evolve and focus, that, focus on evaluating the components of a system or network that pose the greatest threats to patient safety. I would argue the authors recognize placing today's definitions around future medical devices means our sights are lowered rather than focused on the horizon and the innovative technologies we can not yet begin to imagine. Second, we recommend Congress require HHS to contract with independent private certification bodies that would certify non-FDA technologies as safe and effective. Newborns are not little adults, but facing limited treatment options, doctors often use the smallest available version of an adult device on babies to fill gaps where newborn-specific products do not exist. We believe, however, that these medical devices can be made more valuable by health information software that supports these tools. Newborn-specific medical devices should continue to be regulated by the FDA and be subject to significant pre- and post-market evaluation. We do, however, support an alternative certification process for companion health information software. We are engaged in this issue because we have seen health information technology save the lives of newborns, and because in the absence of devices designed specifically for newborns, data created by adult-focused medical devices will be of only limited utility unless they are paired with health information software that can cur curate the data to make it more relevant to newborn care. Health information software is not meant to replace clinicians. Software will enhance the value of device data, and if it does not adversely impact the function or usability of, clear the, of the cleared device it interoperates with, then the software should not be considered a new, a new medical device in and of itself. I would stress that data is not a medical device and does not fit within the statutory mandate of FDA. A public-private certification process is more appropriate means of reviewing these technologies as they come to market. In summation, there is no magic bullet. But with a level of interest from Congress, the administration, and a diversity of stakeholders, it would be a shame to miss this opportunity to reform the system in a way that will foster innovation and improve patient safety for this generation and the next. I thank you very much for the opportunity to testify, and I stand ready to help the committee, committee in any way possible, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Chair, thank you, gentlemen. <clears throat> now recognize uh, the gentleman, Mr. Lemney, asked five minutes to summarize his testimony.
stimulate the human heart to better understand how the military mission is for some things in solution. It is coming from CMO clinical data to the use of family experiments for the patients to better understand and participate in the practical solution. The history of IBM corruption has started to consist of decades, and we have all scientists and engineers at IBM and elsewhere are pushing the boundaries of science and technology to improve the interactive system in a very new way. This week, five years ago, promises a significant shift in the ability of people and organizations to quickly analyze, understand, and unlock the insights contained in the current of data around us. As this press committee knows, health care is one of the most data-rich environments today. Yet physicians are often working with limited information and certain time limits. The results can be hard to make sure fair but really the cost quality of healthcare outcomes. Consider this. Primary care doctors spend on an average of somewhere between 10 to 19 minutes face to face with each patient per day. An estimated 15 percent of diagnoses are inaccurate or incomplete. Medical information is doubling every five years, but 81 percent of physicians spend less than five hours a week doing medical Advanced analytics combined with cognitive computer apps wrapped around this process can help doctors efficiently assess and make use of the patient's information to achieve individualized evidence and treatment outcomes. In addition, advances in technology can help address disparities in outcomes by physicians. Congress can contribute to these advances by ensuring that there is a regulatory environment that encourages innovation by protecting the patient's autonomy. Innovation and improved patients are not inconsistent goals. In fact, innovation can enable better tools for consumers to promote learning and possibly improve care to reduce risk and address outcomes. Cur the current regulatory framework largely developed in decades before the rise of today's sophisticated medical science focuses on traditional discrete tasks now fashioned in a single step and physically put the decision is in one step. While some have embedded platforms, these are frequently physicalized and forced into the commercial environment, modified relatively infrequently, and often do not interact with multiple other entities provided by suppliers. To the rise of network ecosystems, and even more sophisticated software, this paradigm simply doesn't occur in the modern world. The medical technology field is populated with multi-connections. We have interconnections from technology that can be rapidly and easily iterated and improved, through deep collaboration, and through IT partnerships with essential experts. Surely, clarity is needed to emerge a vibrant marketplace packed with very collaborative and novel ideas. Clarity is really what we're after in the next five years. And one area that's called out for clarity is clinical decision support platforms. This is intended to aid clinicians in making decisions rather than making those decisions directly for the patient. It's one of the resources that clinicians can use not solely in lifetime to deep in their decision making process. Currently, it's unclear whether and how CDS will be regulated. And we urge Congress and the administration to work together to clarify this, recognize that in all health care and all software in this arena, the, topic, the software is simply not the same. One size fits all is not the right approach. Using the current medical device regulatory framework to determine if and how regulation of the diversity of potential healthcare software will be used is something that must be very careful. This will cross, without this, we will cross innovation, will delay the, the adoption of supporting tools that can help clinicians better provide health care. Gentlemen's time's expired. Thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Jaron. Five minutes to summarize his testimony. Thank you. Good Would morning, you, Jaron uh, Pitt. I'll put, make sure your uh, mic is up. I had a little trouble hearing the last witness. Is, is your light on? Okay. Ah, 
There we go. Okay. okay. I thought it was on. My apologies. Okay. Good morning, Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Pallone, and members of the subcommittee. Earlier this year, the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology held hearings during the third week of March on health information technologies and innovation, including mobile medical apps. I was honored to have been invited to participate in the first of those hearings, and I'm honored to be here today. Qualcomm Incorporated is the number one global supplier of wireless chips and the leading inventor of 3G and 4G next generation wireless technologies. To date, Qualcomm's chip shipments surpass 11 billion. If a person is using a 3G or 4G device, Qualcomm's technology and ingenuity are being used. Mobile technology continues to be the largest platform in history. Innovation continues to personalize healthcare as health apps are more available than ever via sophisticated smartphones and tablets that rely on powerful, ubiquitous 3G and 4G mobile broadband networks. In fact, according to Mobi Health News research, unique health apps now number over 33,000 in the U.S. After two years, the FDA delivered on its promise, a deregulatory and practical roadmap for the mobile health industry. This is significant for solo developers, garage entrepreneurs, and established medical device manufacturers such as Qualcomm's wholly owned medical device subsidiary, Qualcomm Life. FDA has raised the bar and demonstrated how it can work with industry, be progressive, help speed innovation, and ensure public safety. But more is yet to come as broader issues linger which require the same light touch and flexible approach FDA has now demonstrated it is capable of adopting. Additionally, the final Food Drug Administration Safety Innovation Act or FIDASIA report due at year's end by FDA, ONC, and FCC should contain a proposed strategy and recommendations on an appropriate risk-based regulatory framework pertaining to health IT, including mobile medical applications. Qualcomm offers the following recommendations for consideration. Number one, as recommended by the FIDASIA external working group report, FDA should utilize current program mechanisms that could enable innovations such as assessing exemption from good manufacturing practices for lower risk health IT, expediting guidance on health IT software and related matters, particularly FDA's 2014 proposed guidance development B list that includes medical device decision support software, medical device accessories, and general wellness products. Continue to improve internal coordination on health IT software and its regulatory treatment, and continue to utilize external facing resources to pro proactively educate the public about how policies and regulation impact health IT and mobile medical apps. Number two, FDA, ONC, and FCC should address policy and regulatory deficiencies, ambiguities, and duplication in the final FIDASIA report. Number three, FDA should continue its commitment to consistency, predictability, and transparency by coordinating internal and external efforts through a single dedicated office of mobile health within FDA. Number four, interoperability is a critical concern for reliable data exchange and secure health communications to and from mobile devices. The FDA should collaborate closely with ONC in supporting the direct messaging exchange standards and the direct trust security and trust framework. Number five, privacy, data use rights, and identity management issues have unique concerns in relation to mobile health devices. Close collaboration between the FDA, ONC, and FTC are essential to the establishment of consistent standards and requirements for industry, healthcare providers, and the public. Qualcomm underscores the importance of FIDASIA's work and encourages the involved agencies to utilize existing program mechanisms to enable innovation immediately while they explore how to improve and modify existing frameworks or, if needed, develop recommendations for Congress to consider a new risk-based regulatory framework. What the public and industry don't need is a situation where innovation suffers as a result of regulatory confusion on health IT software, which is why existing program mechanisms are vital policy tools that can be employed promptly. The end goal should be for a regulatory framework that allows new technology to flourish, promotes innovation, avoids regulatory duplication, and above all, it protects patient safety. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Chair, thanks, gentlemen, and now recognize Mr. Lichtenfeld, five minutes for opening summary. Thank you, Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Pallone, and members of the subcommittee. I'm Dr. Len Lichtenfeld. I'm Deputy Chief Medical Officer for the American Cancer Society, and I thank you all for the opportunity to testify before you today. Software applications play an increasingly integral role in the care of patients, including and especially patients with cancer. So I applaud this committee's bipartisan attention to providing proper level of oversight for these products. As we all know, cancer care has changed significantly in the past 40 years when it might have been enough for a physician to manually assess a tumor size 
determine the appropriate diagnosis and recommend the treatment for a patient with cancer. We're now moving to, into an era where everything from sending patient appointment reminder emails to analyzing genetic tests are all done using software. And software applications have increased our ability to quickly and accurately diagnose patients and develop the most effective treatment plans, as mentioned earlier today. Continued innovation in this space is an urgent priority for cancer patients, survivors, their families, loved ones, and of course their health care professionals. At the same time, the power of software applications to improve patient care must be tempered by potential dangers that come with any new medical intervention. We would consider it unethical to administer new drugs as part of a patient's treatment without first understanding both the safety and the efficacy of those medications. And similarly, we need to understand the safety and efficacy of integrating software applications directly into patient care. In terms of the appropriate calibration of oversight for software applications, you'll find nearly universal agreement that low-risk products do not merit FDA oversight, while high-risk ones do. The real challenge lies in how to create oversight for the space in between that may include clinical software, mobile apps, similar products. Rather than commenting on specific proposals, I would like to offer several broad design criteria for your consideration. First and foremost, patient safety and privacy are paramount to all of us. It is the first duty of medical professionals, the relevant oversight agencies and policymakers to ensure that patients are not subjected to dangerous, ineffective, or misleading treatment and that their information is secure. Second, any information oversight system should be fluid. Technology is advancing at a speed challenging our ability to provide uh, effective oversight. And some technology in use today was, as we know, almost unheard of five years ago. And so any new oversight structure should not be so rigid that it cannot quickly adapt to new realities. Third, details matter. If changes are enacted to create new categories of medical software applications with differing levels of oversight, then the defini definitions of those categories must be very clear and not create loopholes, ambiguities, or unintended consequences. Fourth, focus the solution on the actual problem. Innovation in software and mobile apps can be promoted through regulatory certainty and the relief of regulatory burden on software sectors where it is not appropriate. This may be possible with narrower policy changes aimed at targeted sets of software rather than the full spectrum of software and mobile apps. In closing, let me reiterate that an innovative new software will be crucial to making progress against cancer and ensuring patient safety. We need a risk-based oversight paradigm for this software that does not impose a heavy regulatory hand that might otherwise stifle innovation. But we must never allow the pursuit of innovation to displace patient safety and privacy as our primary considerations. Wherever software is involved directly in patient health, oversight is not only appropriate, but it is necessary. I thank you again for the opportunity to share our views, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Chair, thanks uh, the gentleman. <clears throat> that concludes the opening summaries. Uh, we'll now begin questioning. I'll recognize myself five minutes for that purpose. Uh, Mr. Lemnios, uh, why, in your opinion, is it important that Congress address regulating medical apps? <clears throat> why is it important that Congress address regulating medical apps, in your opinion? Pull that mic a little closer. They say you're having trouble here. You. Let's try this. There you go. <laughs> That's good. You know, you guys really ought to get an IBM mic. <laughs> this doesn't say IBM. All right. All right. We'll, we'll start over. Uh, the, the question was, why should Congress, uh, why should this committee make a recommendation and, and pursue this? Look, I, th I think it's an issue of clarity, and, and in fact, uh, that will help our business decisions, and I think it will help uh, decisions of small innovators as well, and, and that's really what we want, not, not to compromise patient safety, but to build that, that environment that encourages innovation in this field. Thank you. Mr. Marchlick, do you think the FDA has the regulatory structure 
to appropriately regulate medical labs? I believe that I believe that they have certain structures that they've been able to use for embedded software very effectively. What we've seen, the where we, we have uh, questions is around clinical software, where implementation and use of the software is just as important as the development. And there, what we've found, what we see is that FDA doesn't have the oversight models necessary to ensure patient safety across that continuum. Mr. Bialik, do you think the regulation of medical devices is best addressed through agency guidance, legislation, or combination of both? I think it's most likely a combination of both. Uh, the, I, I think in hearing Dr. Shuren's testimony that there is, it's quite clear that there is an effort uh, within FDA to, to do the right thing, to figure out how to, to, uh, to, to fix the process. But I also think that it is important to note that through the FIDESIA working group but that he mentioned, the, and so did uh, Mr. Jaron mentioned the external working group, as well as those that will make the report, uh, I guess, in the first quarter of next year, there were a number of issues that were identified by not only stakeholders with, that were part of that external working group, but actually represent, representatives from the agencies, FA, uh, FDA, FCC, and ONC, that identified that there were some issues that, um, that like we said before, broken at the level of the written law. And if that's the case, then you're very well going to need a hybrid uh, of both. Uh, Mr. Lemnios, one of the main themes in this hearing is how quickly technology is evolving. Some may argue that because the industry is changing so much so quickly, we should just continue to releasing gui guidances. Why do you think we should address this legislatively, and how do you suggest we incorporate enough flexibility to make sure the agency is equipped with the flexibility to adapt to this evolving industry? So that's the tension in the dialogue. The tension is how much flexibility and how much certainty will there be in this environment. And I think what the bill has done, I, you know, I would compliment uh, uh, the Congressman, the, the representative for, for drafting this. What the bill has done is it, it's laid out three imperatives that, in, in our view, sort of lay the structure. Whether there's direct uh, change in function or structure of the body, whether there's inv an involvement of a health care provider, and whether the software is marketed to individuals or to health care providers. I think those are three key elements that, that you could build on. Now, there's going to be a lot of discussion about the eaches. There will be a lot of discussion, does this particular software fit under this category or, or that? But I think the, the basic structure of what's put in place really provides a, a, a way to build on this. Let me ask each of you to respond to this question. We'll start the other end. Dr. Lichtenfeld, can you discuss the impact health IT can have on the personalization of medicine as well as the potential to lower medical cost? Well, I, you know, obviously it's a world that I live in in a lot of different ways, and there's no question whatsoever that health information technology is going to have a huge impact on patient care. It's going to have a huge impact on directing personalized medicine, precision medicine, and making sure that it works right is critically important. We have to have the certainty that we need, not only as health professionals, as patients, we need to make certain, just as we do with our medications, that what people say something is going to do is, in fact, going to do it. Okay. We're in a journey and a discussion with the early part of that discussion as we're here today uh, with, uh, obviously, much more to come in the not-too-distant future. Mr. Jaron? Health IT has and will continue to have a huge impact uh, on America, especially things like cost savings. Uh, I would only point out that 330 million subscriptions in America right now for mobile devices yet one out of two adults, according to the CDC, one out of almost uh, every, uh, uh, one out of two adults in America has at least one chronic illness. And it, it, chronic disease is about 75 percent of our health care costs. I think you will start to see that go down as the ubiquity of health IT uh, continues. Briefly, Mr. Lemnios. Yeah, again, I, I, I view the, uh, the impact both on the private, uh, on the uh, patient side, but also on the provider side. If, if I look at the enormous growth in information that, that a health care provider can, can access, a doctor can access, software that, that, that translates that complexity into something that provides some insight is going gonna, is gonna to have a significant value. So, in fact, it will, I, I think in both cases, there will be a significant improvement. Mr. Bialy. I, I absolutely do believe health IT will have a huge impact on the personalization of medicine. We often talk about personalized medicine like it's a single thing. Like we can go buy personalized medicine, but personalized medicine is uh, is 
the consequence of a health uh, technology enabled healthcare system where we're able to communicate between devices, between providers, between patients, and have that information curated in a way that it's valuable to the individual at the point of care. Mr. Murray. Yes, I would agree that it will, and you know the data is there, and the uh, the opportunities are to find applications which actually can unlock that data and help with personalization. Thank you. My time's expired. Chair, recognize the ranking member, Mr. Pallone, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My questions are of Dr. Lichtenfeld. You note in your testimony that it is necessary to ensure that any new definitions enacted into statute be very clear and not create loopholes, ambiguities, or unintended consequences. You also note that many software applications contain multiple functions, and each individual function in isolation could conceivably fit into a different regulatory category. So clarity is needed about where in the regulatory scheme these multifunctional applications fit. Those points argue, at least for me, that this is not an area that could be easily addressed through legislation. And FDA's recently issued guidance appears to me to have been well received by many stakeholders who have indicated that it provides the necessary clarity to allow innovations to flourish. So as you say in your testimony, any oversight structure should not be so rigid that it can't quickly adapt to new realities. So my questions are, are you concerned that legislation will not provide the requisite flexibility here? Do you agree that guidance is an appropriate way to oversee this kind of technology? Far be it from me to say to Congress whether or not you are able to legislate something. That is uh, in your purview, and I understand that. The American Cancer Society understands that. Um, I mentioned a moment ago there are substantial conversations that are currently ongoing, and I believe that this legislation begins the process within the legislative branch, but certainly within the private sector uh, and within the advocacy sector and with interested parties. We have had a lot of discussions surrounding these issues. So our concern is that the FDA guidance meets a need at the present time, that uh, listening to the testimony today reinforces, in my opinion, that they have the flexibility and the direction that we need today. But we are going to be having a different conversation even within the next several months, and that definitions do matter. Not that they are not appropriate, not that they are not important, but they do matter. And putting something into um, legislative language today to codify something when even in a couple of months we may be having a, a different discussion or a more informed discussion among all the parties, both governmental, legislative, private sector, advocacy, uh, this may not be the right time for us to do that as opposed to, uh, number one, seeing how the FDA guidance works, and number two, uh, listening to the, 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 the reports and discussions that we are going to be having, as I mentioned, in the not too distant future, hopefully. Well, thank you. Let me uh, also say the FDA indicated on the first panel that the Blackburn Bill would exempt from all FDA oversight such apps as radiation therapy planning software and mammography detection software, to name a couple. I have no doubt that the sponsors of the bill had no intention of exempting such apps from oversight, but these examples generally illustrate the difficulty of deriving the perfect language through legislation. Would you be concerned about legislation that permanently remov removed FDA's jurisdiction over certain types of software that might ultimately pose patient safety risks? risks? Well, it's not a question so much of opposing the legislation and making sure that we understand the potential risk of unintended consequences. And definitions, as I mentioned, definitions matter. Getting those definitions right in legislative language is, a, is an art. It's difficult. It has to be done properly. If we don't do it properly, we do run the risk of having um, uh, we do believe we have issues of oversight difficulties uh, and what we would call unintended consequences, so that the definitions are critically important. Now, you make another impor important point in your testimony that we are still awaiting the report that, that Congress requested in last year's uh, FIDASIA legislation from FDA, from the Office of the Natural, National Coordinator for Health Info Technology and the FCC. So do you agree that any legislation that we consider here should be informed by that report? I do. Uh, as you are well, as you are probably aware, um, there have been several reports, uh, one from the Bipartisan Policy Center that came out recently, another one from the Office of the National Coordinator. We are awaiting the report from the working group, as, as was mentioned. And I think that in, in, in the, in the, what I think is an appropriate place is to say we need to have that information, we need to be able to understand that information, we need to have the input of all the relevant stakeholders before we advance a legislative remedy 
uh, with that, uh, before we advance the legislative remedy, I should say. All right. Thanks a lot. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'm not convinced there is a problem that needs to be fixed here, and if there is, that it should be addressed by such a broad piece of legislation that virtually rewrites FDA's oversight of what is a fast-moving technology. But I, I think it's important that we have this hearing today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thank you, gentlemen. Now I recognize the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You all have been very patient with us, and I hope I don't take my whole five minutes. How's that for starters? <laughs> um, Mr. Marchlick, three quick questions, and I thank you for your testimony. I want you to sign, uh, just kind of give a brief, concise overview, the difference between health IT and medical devices, why they need to be approached differently, uh, you argued in your testimony that the FDA is not well suited for regulating the software. I want you to expand a bit on why. And then uh, going back to the FIDESIA work group recommendations that were presented to the ONC Policy Committee earlier this month, I want to know what you thought about that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I think it's, it's important that, you know, we, we believe that the, le that the legislation, and we agree that the FDA would still be well suited to regulating certain types of software. Um, some of the applications that we expect would still be regulated would be, for example, our perinatal care you know, monitoring uh, type of software. Some of our cardiology products would meet those definitions, would still be regulated by the FDA. What, we, what I testified to and what we believe is that in that clinical software space, it's not just a development, right? and it's not just the manufacturer, which his standard is, is regulated by the FDA, but it is its implementation and use. We deliver products that actually require input um, and configuration of m the practice of medicine for it to actually be fully functional. And the FDA oversight doesn't extend that far. What we'd be looking for is the new oversight model, which would be able to expand and, and, uh, and address that whole segment of that. Um, on the FIDESIA report, um, I believe that a lot of, of, of the uh, findings that came out of the FIDESIA report were consistent with the BPC report. Um, and maybe I think it's interesting is that we talk about, uh, you know, the need for legislation or not. Partly, I think what happened is that in parts of the, of the uh, report, um, they were constrained because the only oversight was FDA oversight. And therefore, if there was a need for oversight, it pointed to FDA versus nothing else. And there's a gap there, and that's we think the bill is very good about laying out that there should be an alternative for type of clinical software. Excellent. Thank you for that. Mr. Bialik, um, does the FDA currently require changes to existing drugs or devices on the market to go through an FDA review process before they go to the patient? So you're asking if there are changes to existing devices? Yes. Um, I, as someone who has never put a device through uh, the process, I, I unfortunately right. can't answer that. Okay, let me uh, move on then. I was asking that in relation, Dr. Shuren, um, during his answer to Congressman Lance, said that patches or updates to the apps that could improve or harm patient safety would not have to go through the FDA approval process. So uh, does that concern you? I th the, the question in my mind is really um, uh, how how those errors or how those bugs are coming to people's attention. I think that what really we should be trying to do here is foster an environment where there is uh, uh, a, a, tr a transparent nature, I mean a combination of punitive and non-punitive uh, uh, mechanisms and levers that would allow uh, both vendors, maybe through the protections of something like patient safety organizations, as well as providers, uh, and really patients to have a, a way to redress their grievances, to say, there is a problem, we want to figure out what it is and fix it as fast as possible. Now, depending on if this is the world of the Software Act or if this is the world of FDA now, whether that goes through the FDA, whether that goes back through a certification process, whatever it is, I think just the, the real takeaway there is that we need to have a system of transparency so if there are patches, we know why they were needed. Okay. So I, I guess what you're saying that enforcement discretion rather than certainty could have some unintended consequences on patient safety, especially with the very delicate patients that you all focus upon. Is that fair? Uh, I think in certain circumstances, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Chair, thanks. Gentlelady, now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Villarakis, five minutes for questions. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it very much. In the 1970s, Congress wrote the statute giving FDA the authority to regulate medical devices. As is often the case, technology will outrace the law, and government is forced to use outdated laws to deal with emerging situations. When the medical device statute was created, we did not have personal computers, cell phones, the Internet, or cloud computing. Uh, yet these things are part of our daily lives. We need to modernize the law, in my opinion, to provide clarity to the FDA and the medical software industry on the regulatory framework for their uh, respective industries. And I want to ask uh, Mr. Markett uh, the question, Mr. Markett. Uh, you have suggested in your testimony that different types of health IT should be regulated differently. Correct. Isn't that exactly what the FDA is doing using uh, their discretion? I believe that what they have attempted to do within the boundaries of, of the current legislation is to use enforcement discretion to carve out those products which they are not going to actively enforce. Um, I think that what's needed is actually to take a fresh look at that and also to expand that, like I've, been, uh, like I've discussed, to expand that across the platform, including clinicians, including the way we implement and use. We need to have a framework that works across, and that's why we support the legislation is it calls for that, which would be uh, in addition to what the FDA is doing with the higher risk products. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Lemnios, uh, IBM has proposed uh, that Watson your uh, supercomputer could provide medical assistance to doctors. That's very exciting. It has the ability to review medical records, the latest in medical research, and provide recommendations or options to physicians during uh, the diagnosis uh, process. Would this be regulated like a medical device by uh, the FDA, in your opinion? Well, Congressman, I'm, I can't comment on Watson as a particular product. I think this the discussion here, I think, is much bigger than that, and, and that's really about how decision support software would be regulated. And I'll come back to the comments that I made earlier. I think in, in, in framing the arguments, in framing how, how this regulation could be structured, the distinction between whether that software is provided to the patient or the clinician is a key one. The distinction of whether that software is used uh, to support a decision or to make a decision is a clear one. And the, and the distinction of whether that uh, is uh, whether the result of that software, the conclusions, are interpreted by an individual or interpreted by a, a clinician is, is a key one. I think those are the key, as, as we view it, those are the key structure, structural elements of, of, of uh, how to think about this. And I think the bill clearly outlines that. Thank now, you. Watson is a, is a technology that we're developing. We, we're training it. We're training it in many fields. It's in, it's in the financial sector. Uh, we're training it in the medical community. We have other areas that we will train systems like that. But I will simply tell you that the, the field of analytics and the field of cognitive computing where humans interact with data in a very natural way, that field is exploding. We see that across the VC community. We see that in other areas. And I think that will be a key, key element of, of this uh, field going forward. Hey, if it were regulated by the FDA, why don't you tell me, maybe you can uh, elaborate a little bit, what kind of implications would that have? Uh, would it raise the cost of the computer system? Uh, would it make it slower to provide updates and improve the system? So updates or, or uh, updates and uh, on any software is, is a key cost issue. It's a risk issue, and it's a, it, and it's a delivery timeline issue. I mean, we really need to see the clarity. And the reason we support the bill is because we need clarity in this space. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. That uh, concludes the uh, questions. The members here. We have two hearings going at the same time, so I'm sure some of the members will have follow-up questions. We'll send them to you. We ask that you please respond promptly, if you would. This is a very, very important hearing. Thank you very much for the information for coming today. I remind members they have ten business days to submit questions for the record. And uh, members should submit those questions by the close of business on Thursday, December 5. Without objection, the subcommittee is adjourned.